Charles, how do you stay strong against all these haters? Consider your personal wealth. How do you stay motivated? Well, first off, money means nothing. It's, it's there. You have things. You live a good lifestyle. You eat better food. It just makes you fatter. Uh, so never think of wealth. It's just a means to an end. It's not an end to itself. In terms of motivation, you know, hate e either comes from misunderstanding or misincentive. And so misunderstanding, you can educate people and try to build bridges and communicate and create empathy with people. Uh, and misincentives are just a matter of, well, they make something at a cost to me. And if I make something, it's at a cost to them. It's some zero. Changing systems improves incentives. And then we can be friends. Uh, education and communication resolves misunderstanding. Uh, and the circle of people that you can convert from haters to lovers uh, increases. But at some point, there's going to be people on the periphery that never want to change uh, because the hate in some way makes them, validates their existence. But one of my favorite quotes, it was a question that was a little earlier, was uh, hate is like taking poison and hoping the other person gets sick. Uh, the haters are actually hurting themselves. They don't actually hurt me. Uh, between the, in, the, the input and the output, there's a reaction. And free will, if it exists, is our capacity, our ability to not let the input bother us and to change the output from that input. So when people criticize you, as long as you understand it's either a misincentive or a misunderstanding, uh, then, uh, then generally speaking, it has no impact at all. There is a third category where hate is legitimate uh, because you've done something wrong. So there is this open question of how much self-reflection do you want to have? If you go too far in one direction, then you live in a world where you're blameless and you make no mistakes. Narcissistic people and sociopaths tend to live in that world. It's a very dangerous world, and it's easy to fall into in some part if you've been overexposed to criticism and hatred. You start just living in a bubble that protects you from all criticism. So how you sort out hate from other things is first you look at independence and volume. And at some point, if you see the same criticism from many different sources and many different people with different incentives and different levels of knowledge, there's probably something to that. You know, uh, the old, uh, the old uh, you know, rule of thumb there is if you've been married seven times, it's probably not your ex-wife's problem, it's yours. <laughs> okay, so you look for those trends and those patterns. And then you have to objectively look at the criticism. Is it criticism that's personal? Is it conduct related? Is it reputation and past related? If something is criticizing you for something in the past that's been resolved, ignore it. They're holding on to a version of you that doesn't exist anymore. If something is uh, for today or things you're doing, then it's a question of values. Are your values different? In which case the criticism is legitimate, but irresolvable uh, because you just look at the world differently. You value things differently. For example, if you want to live in a society that's stable with a king and another person wants to live in a society that's a cooperative and everybody's equal, you're never going to align. And everything you do to propagate the monarchy is antithetical to everything that they stand for, but in your view is the right action. So you'll get criticized, but in your view, you're doing the right thing. And in their view, they're moral. You see, so you can't get past it. So the other thing when you're starting to analyze criticism uh, from a hater and ask, is this legitimate or not? You always have to take a step back and say, are we disagreeing about facts, conduct, or values? And if it's a values-based debate, it, then unfortunately, you're never going to get a resolution if your values are immutable uh, because other people will seldom change their values after, uh, after they've set. Uh, so uh, when you have that kind of dispassionate model and uh, enough self-awareness and good people that are willing to tell you the truth uh, and the ability to reflect on a regular basis, uh, it helps a lot. Now, uh, there are a lot of tools like mindfulness and meditation that are tremendously powerful as well, especially for dispassionate reflection on things. Uh, mindfulness, in essence, is the capacity to put yourself here and you somehow consciously can be here and you observe you and your surrounding. And you don't react to the things that you observe, positive and negative. You just see them and experience them. 
And then because you're in that state, you can actually start making a strategy for how to change and what to do and what to improve. Um, and, you know, generally kind of works its way out. Now, wealth is power. You know, it's locked up frozen power. It's the productive capacity of society. And so I have a lot of it. And so what does it mean? It means that I can utilize that as I see fit. Uh, and you can utilize it somewhat in luxury. That actually helps the economy in a certain respect. But also you can utilize it in things to change things. So, for example, there's the Hoskins Center for Formal Mathematics. You follow the thread of that over the next 10 years, 20 years. If I continue to invest in it and build it, it's probably going to rewrite all of mathematics in a way that's machine understandable. And then suddenly we can use AI in mathematical research in ways we'd never anticipated before. Great. But it also solves a very big problem that math has, which is mathematical proofs are becoming too abstract, too domain specific, and too hard to verify. So they need to be written in a way where we can debug them just like we debug software programs. Software programs are very collective things and they grow and grow and grow. And could you imagine writing software without unit tests or test driven development or regression tests or all kinds of things? You'd never write reliable software. So the point of making math written in a way that's somewhat machine understandable is your proof could be debugged with much more sophisticated tools. And eventually you could even talk about QA. So you can have mathematicians that do nothing but actually work on improving, refactoring, refining proofs and QA proofs. We do QA right now in the mathematical community through the general referee process, which is super slow, super stateful, and you get a lot of asymmetries there and it's very reputation based. So we're making it more egalitarian by making math machine understandable. So because I'm personally wealthy, I have the luxury to endow an institute that over time, independent of me, has the capacity to do that for the totality of the entire mathematical community. So personal wealth in this respect is a responsibility as much as it is a luxury of asking with the small wave you've been given between the two desks you know, when the time before you're born and the time after you die, what are you going to do with that power? And the magic of modern society is we have institutions that are durable and live beyond us. So you can use that wealth to endow those institutions, systems, companies, philosophies, academic bodies that basically carry out that research and push it through. Uh, and my belief is that... Uh, you know, life well spent is one where you've been very careful in selecting the things that live beyond you and asking how can these things in some way make the world better. And my personal values and philosophy are always stemming around more equal, more fair, more egalitarian, more accessible in that respect. That's why I like Colossal as a company. Uh, synthetic biology is going to bring creatures back to life. And we're going to basically take things that we thought we'd close the chapters on and be able to see them again as humans, study them, learn from them, and uh, hopefully gain some wisdom that is sorely needed.